हेलो एंड वेलकम टू इनसाइट्स एन इंटरव्यू सीरीज प्रेजेंटेड टू यू बाय नालसा सेंटर फॉर टैक्स लॉस एंड सपोर्टेड बाय टैक्स मैन फॉर आवर सेकंड एपिसोड आई एम प्लीज टू इनवाइट आवर गेस्ट मिस्टर आलोक प्रसन्न कुमार अ लीडिंग एक्सपर्ट इन कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल लॉ इन आवर कंट्री पर्टिकुलरली इन द इंटरसेक्शन ऑफ कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल लॉ एंड टैक्सेशन टुडे वी सी to learn gain more insights from his journey in the profession as well as his views on the recent decision of the supreme court in union of india versus mohit minerals which has a significant bearing on how we understand fiscal federalism particularly in the new gst regime so so on behalf of nalsa center for tax laws i want to thank you once again for taking out the time from for your, from your busy schedule my pleasure anurag it's always happy to be here yes sir before uh, diving into the whole complex world of taxation I just wanted to ask you a few more questions, just to get to know you better. Because after all, you are our dear alumni. You graduated from Nalsar in the year two thousand eight. So, what's your most fond memory from Nalsar? A lot of things, actually. Um, I, and I, I, I don't want to pick any one thing, but it's a combination of things. It's a combination of when I joined Nalsar in my stage of life, what Nalsar was then. Um, I know it may be hard. for say somebody currently on the campus to understand and imagine it but there were maybe less than half the buildings that there are currently right now on campus the mess was about 1/8 the size of it was it was just one big giant hall that's about it hmm. um, and uh, the student body was small uh, there were i think when i joined there were no more than 300 300 or so i think 350 or so people it expanded eventually to about 500 because the first few llm batches are joined by the time i graduated but um it it it, it feels it, it's i know it's about 15 years uh, later 15 to 20 years later but it is it feels like a completely different institution and university um i love the fact that we were way outside town uh, we were in the midst of nature even though that nature was rocks and snakes and scorpions and but of course there was a beautiful lake uh, it broke out into greenery once the rains came in uh, at seclusion i think help it, it helped create i suppose much greater bonds between us uh, those on the campus um, it uh, sort of meant that we had to sort of learn more skills of socialization among people who are not like us uh, at at that point of time you know uh, nalsa was a lot more i think diverse than it became after clat uh partly because uh i think at that time uh we were able to attract people from all various i mean of course subject to being able to pay the fees but even then um i do feel and i felt this uh, even in the subsequent batches coming in that uh, there was a change in the socio economic and you know various demographics in nalsar so yeah you had to sort of learn how to get along with people absolutely not like you in every way possible um and uh, that sort of meant that you grew as a person i really enjoyed the academic experience at nalsa um i can say perhaps without fear of too much contradiction that we enjoyed some of the uh, we enjoyed some of the best faculty that nalsa has had because there were a great mix of a very well established professors you had professor uh, arabi you had a legend like professor vipa sarathi um you had uh, professor ramakrishna and professor subara who taught us history and uh, political science well respected in their own fields long experience of teaching and you also had a group of very young and very motivated uh, teachers uh, such as you know uh, professor maitri who was my tax professor i am mentioning only because of the in the context of the discussion uh, so i'd say nalsar gave me that solid grounding conceptually it gave me a, a, a certain level of academic rigor it gave me a certain exposure to life to various things in life and i think it has fundamentally helped shape who i am today uh, i i would say that without any hesitation so i i'd say it was some of the best years of my life uh, no one particular memory stands out but you know <laughs> if i have to be extremely cheeky about it uh, perhaps the experience of getting hungry at 2 o'clock in the morning because you forgot to eat dinner while preparing for exams and ordering in uh, parathas from the dhaba and finding that yeah actually they kind of sent it ant infested so you pick up the paratha you shake off the ants and you eat it all the same things like that uh, and uh, uh, without shocking people who are used to fssai standards i say all of these are part of uh, your formative experiences in life uh, you learn to handle the ups and the downs you learn to handle the challenges again by yourself um you will learn to navigate bureaucracy which you know, whatever the size of the university there is always going to be bureaucracy 
you learn how to navigate different competing interests. I was on the SBC then, I think about uh, tri uh, twice, uh, actually in my third year, uh, fourth year and fifth, third year and fifth year. Mm -hmm. I have learned how different people think about different things, where they come from, why they think certain things are right. I'm good friends with almost everyone in my batch who are still in touch with. Um, and, you know, it's it, on our alumni various WhatsApp and uh, uh, in telegram groups there is no sense of we, we may have had fights we may have had various disagreements but there's no sense of bitterness or you know grudge for holding funds then so I, I at least for me I, I had a really great time at Nalsar and I really enjoyed myself yes sir. it's really fun to hear I mean I don't know in other respects but at least with respect to hunger pangs at 2am I think Nalsar has made great strides now oh. I mean the number of options we have on campus is yes. just thanks to the very SBC who brought in so many more uh, you know, eat three joints on campus, but yeah. So, sir, uh, <coughs> immediately after NALSA, you did your BCL also, right, from University of Oxford. So, was it around this time itself that you developed a keen interest in constitutional law, or you know, did that develop slowly in life? You know, <coughs> through your practice and all that. Um, I I'd say that uh, my interest was more in always in the area of public law per se. This possibly <laughs> had to do with the kinds of moots that I did, the kinds of papers that I wrote, the kind of subjects that I found interesting. And uh, even in Oxford, the subjects I took were all mostly public law related subjects, things like jurisprudence, socioeconomic rights, competition law, um, and uh, you know, regulation. So all of these were broadly in my area of interest of uh, public law. And uh, my, at least my personal thinking of why I wanted to go to Oxford was that I think at Nalsar, you sort of realize that there is a level at which you can coast. You find that level. I found that level perhaps in fourth year. Some people may be smarter. I found it in second year. They knew this is the level at which, you know, I can say whichever I want to be. I want to be top of the class. I want to be middle of the class. I want to stay just above failing grade. I don't know. I just need to do just this and I will stay above that level and I enjoy myself otherwise. Maybe I found that in my fourth year or so where I'm like, okay, I have done so much. I know this is exactly how much effort I need to do to stay this way. And that's about it. Um, Oxford was a challenge because Oxford, as one of my seniors put it, was the place where you will get exactly as much as you put. The more effort you put in, the more you will get out of Oxford. And that was the real challenge because now um, I was with the best from around the world. And that forced me to you know, push myself further to say, I have to you know, do my better at this. I have to try and be better at this. Um, I still look back at some of the essays that I've written in Oxford and I go, wow, I don't write as well these days. What happened to me? But it's also the it's also the fact that you had the time, the space, the environment, the peers, the guidance to help you write so well. Uh, so I think that was a very uh, great experience for me. I didn't have a spe specific constitutional law focus. I didn't actually know what I wanted to do after Oxford. I was like, yeah, I'll come back to India and I'll figure it out what's there. And that is where, you know, towards the last few days of uh, my time at Oxford, I got this email from a friend saying, hey, there's this uh, senior advocate in Delhi who is uh, looking for two juniors uh, and he's willing to pay quite a bit, by the way. So don't think that you're going to be subsidizing him. So why don't you reach out to him? So I reached out and this was obviously Mr. Mohan Parasaran who sort of said, yeah, sure, this looks great. Uh, why don't you come and meet me in Delhi? Uh, so I was like, sure, I'll come and meet you. When I, when I back, went back to India, I went and met him in uh, Delhi and I thought this was probably going to be something like a basic interview where he sees who I am, what I'm up to and whether I'm good for this thing or not. Hmm. And the first thing he asked me, so when can you join? I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, 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 no, no, wait, 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 I, I need people to help me with this thing. You're the right kind of person. Me, yeah, 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 of course. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, yeah, and uh, we sort of, yeah, so he said, yeah, sure, when do you want to start? So August uh, 2009, I uh, began practice in uh, uh, Mr. Mohan Parasaran's chambers. The work was uh, mostly in the context of central government work. He was then additional solicitor general and being additional solicitor general uh, means you will end up doing everything from like the Reliance case, which was one of the biggest corporate disputes at that point of time, where the government had a role. Uh, all the way down to some matter where some widow of a war veteran is fighting for a 50 rupees increase in her pension. And the government is saying, no, we won't give it to you. So that kind of stuff, uh, we, we, on the same day, you would end up dealing with all of this. And I think, likewise, uh, my exposure to the law increased dramatically. I think I learned more in that first one and a half years than I have since and than I did prior. 
because you are exposed to area. I think in my four and a half years of practicing with Mr. Mohan Parasaran, um, I think I was exposed to almost every area of law except maybe two or three. Uh, I can only say IPR, we had absolutely no cases. Admiralty law, we had absolutely no cases. But beyond these, I think every other area of law in some way or the other we covered. Uh, even questions of municipal law, municipal taxation, because there would be cases where the municipal authorities make the central government pay tax. Uh, there would be, of course, contract cases because arbitrations were a thing. Uh, central government always gets caught up in various arbitrations. Uh, land and property law, because uh, you know of the, all the land owned by the central government, especially the defense authorities in multiple areas. Uh, so I saw this as a, both a great challenge and a great learning experience. Uh, in a sense that uh, this was perhaps, it, it, it was a litigation experience I don't think anybody else in the country would have got. Maybe now other people who are working with senior law officers who have that much volume of work might have the same kind of experience. But uh, I think in those four and a half years, I think I got to do the kind of matters, work on kind of cases that 99% of lawyers in this country don't get to do in the, their entire lives. So in that way, it was a great privilege to have uh, worked in those chambers. And you had somebody uh, as uh, a senior who not only entrusted you with responsibility on day one, right? It would be like, these are the briefs, read it, be prepared, uh, I'll need your help on this, uh, but would also give you a certain level of independence. Uh, and like, I'm not going to tell you how to prepare this. You figure out, let me see if it works. If you find a better way, I'm okay with the better way. If you write something in a way that I did not expect, but it actually works better, I'll be okay with it. I'll not tell you this is the template, this is the format you have to follow. Mm -hmm. And it feels that if you, if you have shown the basic level of comp competence and dedication to the task, he will encourage you in the in the profession itself. He would send briefs uh, the way of me and my colleagues all the time of his former clients. Those would come to him in Delhi and say, mm -hmm. we need them. Then he would say, why don't you reach out to them? Why don't you reach out to them? And I think... There are a very few senior advocates, maybe now the number has increased, but back then, there were very few senior advocates who took this kind of generous uh, and broad-minded. And of course, the fact that, you know, he himself had his enormous experience as a, he was one of the top lawyers in uh, Chennai before he moved to uh, Delhi. And he also had this width of uh, experience in uh, practice. So, which is sort of where it was, I think, a great learning experience. It was my privilege to be part of those chambers. I still look back on, the, on, on that period very fondly. Um, and I think uh, it, it was taxing, by the way, sorry, to use a pun, uh, because um, you did work seven days a week. You did work pretty much 16 hours a day, Monday to Friday, and maybe 10 hours, 12 hours a day, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, I will not make any bones that it is quite exhausting. It can lead to burnout. And I can totally see why those six-week vacations are needed. So people who are like, why do the judges get holidays? I'm like, yeah, you try working like one of them. You work seven days a week, minimum of 12 hours a day. And let's see how you feel about vacations afterwards. Because weekends, as a fact, matter of fact, don't exist for people at that level of the profession. And I'm sure it's also mm -hmm. high court level. Uh, but yeah, before getting into all of that, I think one of the things that uh, happened during the course of my work with Mr. Mohan Parast was... Uh, one, we got a lot of tax matters. He was one of two or two, basically, senior advocates, uh, additional solicitor general of the union government who used to handle tax matters. And uh, he would get about 15 to 20 such cases every Monday and Friday. And we would have to read, be ready, brief him, all of that. Mm -hmm. So it's like the steepest learning curve possible. I, I, I like tax, by the way. Thanks to Professor Maitri and then um uh, working with uh, and then sort of like you know reading on doing my own reading uh working with uh, miss arun who was uh, Radha arun who was actually writing a book on indirect taxation i got a fairly good exposure to tax even while at law school but this was another level of challenge uh okay. so it's 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 a, it's a different, different different and a difficult area of law to master and i think i sort of managed to somehow keep my head uh ahead but Keep my head above the water and uh, it was a great uh, learning experience there as well uh, and the other thing of course which really impressed me was in a lot of matters discussing with mr mohan parasaran and his father mr k parasaran who also practiced out of the same uh, building uh or literally the same office um was how they approached questions of constitutional law in the sense that they saw a lot of things 
which you know to, to you and me would be regular political issues as issues of constitution for instance the take the reliance gas dispute right in the public imagination this was two brothers fighting over a gas per, a service a supply deal hmm. but the way mr mohan parasaran approached it was to say hang on whose gas is it actually because it's not as if reliance went uh, by itself and struck the gas and started mining it uh, there was a specific arrangement by which the union government actually allowed them to do so and the reason the union government was able to do so is because of article 297 of the constitution hmm because it says that all valuable things of the shore of india will actually vest in the government and it's not as if you and i can go tomorrow with a ship and say hey i'm going to start prospecting for gas here there is a particular constitutional and legal regime that you are bound by that was so far as the extraction was concerned and even so far as the use of that gas was concerned that was also where mr parasaran brought in the angle that it's not private property just because you extract the gas nowhere does it say it becomes your private property uh it has to be used in accordance with law for the better interest of the greater interest of the nation and you know you have to therefore look at terms of the production sharing contract and a bunch of other legislations which govern all of this so before you go into whether it is this of uh, brothers or that brothers let's try and understand what is the government's role in this in the government's role wasn't taken that seriously with the bombay high court but once mr parasaran sort of came into the matter that then the the whole complexion of the case changed and you sort of see the final judgment Hmm. Uh, Justice V. S. Sudarshan Reddy kind of go in depth into all of these issues, which I believe was something that Mr. Parasaran sort of raised, and this is a case that I got to work on fairly closely, and I sort of saw how the arguments evolved, how the thinking changed, how the approach changed. So, which is where I think that is what got me more interested in thinking about. You know, the Constitution deals with more than just Part Three, I think, which is the more glamorous part of the Constitution. But let's kind of read up a little bit more about it and understand and do my own research and do my own reading. So. that's that's sort of how i sort of i guess got started on this journey right so sir i mean you had you were having such a i mean you were learning a lot with mr parasaran you spent you know so many years practicing at the supreme court and the high court as well when exactly did the thought come to set up you know a think tank like vidhi mm-hmm. was this something that you always wanted to do or you know what exactly the story behind vidhi sure so as a by by about like 4 4 and a half years or so you start thinking about like what do i want to and that's when you have to take i think a pretty straightforward call either you say litigation is definitely for me and uh, i'm going to invest all my time and energy in going independent and building my own practice or you say this is not for me i think i'll try something else i wanted a third option where i'll say let me try something else and see if it doesn't work i always have litigation to back up because at that point of time i think uh i was in a position where you know uh, i had a uh, Lot of start building a bunch of clients on my own through Mr. Parasaran's good offices. Um, I had started handling a few matters on my own. I was getting a steady stream of work, and I was like, "This is actually kind of good. This is going okay." But I didn't feel that this is what I want to necessarily do. So I was thinking a little bit more in terms of research, in terms of a little bit of thinking about the institution itself, because I'd worked and seen the Supreme Court closely. And what I saw was that everybody was looking at the output of the institution without looking at what the institution itself was doing. you will get coverage of judge said this judge said that court said this in judgment court said that in judgment that's about it just we what less than half a percent of what the court actually does but it doesn't go into metaphorically how the sausage is made how is the case actually filed how does it move to the system how long does it take how is it allocated how all of this has now in the last five years become very very important everyone now knows about the master of the roaster and things like that uh but this was something that i thought was just not there in the public discourse is not there people weren't looking at this and i sort of saw someone like nick robinson do this fascinating study of the supreme court and uh, it it sort of i mean this this came a little afterwards but i was thinking you know this this is an area which needs research and i am somebody who's interested in research um and i wasn't sure exactly what i want to do which is when i sort of found out that orgo sen gupta i knew him from oxford was going to set up something like with me um and uh, i was like hey i want to join i even sent in an email with like a uh, cv and so and he said yeah just shut up and join uh so this was something that as an as an idea orgo had i think around 2012 sometime uh it was encouraged by a bunch of people including uh, the first chairman of our board mr ganguly ak ganguly of uh, hll fame not ak ganguly the senior advocate usually get oh. um and uh, he was looking to set this up as an independent entity which will undertake legal research and which will assist government in making better laws 
so I think uh, there, that was when I sort of wanted to join. I said, sure. Uh, we did a little bit of the initial legwork to set up the place. Um, and we really started officially in December 2013 out of my living room. Uh, because uh, although I just moved in, I don't think he had enough big space. Uh, Zoeb and I were sharing an apartment at that time and we had this gigantic living room with enough space for about five people to sit together uh, and work and have enough plug points and have enough internet and all those things. And uh, as it would have, it's December December in Delhi and it's cold. So yeah. Three, four or five, five of us just huddling around one heater, uh, trying not to freeze uh, in Delhi's uh, winter, working on what would movie look like, what it would do, what it would be. And we of course had a lot of uh, help on the way, but that's the genesis of Vidhi. Uh, we got our own office eventually and all of that. But uh, that's the genesis of Vidhi. The idea was something that Orgo had. He's done the work for it. And uh, I joined in about six months before it was formally set up and it effectively started off from my living room. That's interesting. So, but do you think over the last decade, Vidhi has evolved in a way that you thought it would? Uh, many years ago, like, do you? Uh, what did you anticipate with he would become? Like at the time when it was being founded, I had no such anticipations or expectations. I was like, uh, we'll take this year by year. I think in, in, in initially there was a three-year plan as to how much funds we'll raise, how many people we'll have, what we'll do. Um, but I don't think in my wildest imagination I would have thought that by 2022, Didi will be in three different cities. We'll have about 95 staff or so, including researchers and everyone. Um, we'll have a budget in the double-digit cross. Um, and we'll have the kind of impact that it has had. Um, I think our best expectation was, yeah, you know, maybe we might get to draft a couple of laws here and there. We brought some interesting reports here and there. And hopefully people will look at it and cite it and so on. Mm -hmm. I did not think that, uh, honestly, in my wildest imagination, that we would have this kind of a response, this kind of uptake, this kind of reach, this kind of impact uh, in many different ways. Uh, our, our, our goals are, I think, very modest. Let's try and see how this goes for three years. I suppose in some senses, we were all a little bit lucky that worst comes to worst, right? See, we're doing it at a stage of our career, we would have a fallback. We all, we have had, we have, we all had CVs prior to this. Hmm. Uh, they bunch had worked in a law firm. Orgo was teaching in Oxford. Dhani had been teaching in Oxford. I had litigation background. We brought all of that background into it. But I think we were all at some level going, you know what, let's try our best. But we don't need to be so, like, uh, it's not a matter of survival for us that Vidhi has to succeed in that way. And it allowed us to take, I think, principled decisions about a lot of things. It allowed us to take well-thought-out calls about a lot of things that have ensured its success in this time. Uh, ensure that it's gotten to here in this time. And I would still say, we have not yet completed 10 years. We're still a young organization, um, in both in terms of how long the organization has been out and the average age profile of the person who works in the organization. Uh, so I'd say we still have a long way to go. But this was, no, they, definitely, there is there was no specific plan to say by 10 years, we'll be 100 people in three cities. So all of this has been a combination of hard work, of luck, of other people helping us, of the right kind of circumstances happening around us. So I'd say, yeah, it's, I mean, I'm grateful to be here where we are right now. That's really interesting, sir. I mean, Vidhi has had a lot of impact on like the kind of research reports they create. But on a more personal level, I see Vidhi's impact on my batchmates. Like several of my batchmates intern with Vidhi. And when they finish the internship and, you know, they start doing the project, they're completely different people. Like the kind of research methodologies that they pick up over there just completely changes the quality of their projects. So on a personal level, I think that's the impact of Vidhi on Nalsar, I would say. No, so that's, that's great. And I'm heartened to hear that. I mean, this was an impact we didn't know we were having. And thank you for pointing that out. I, I think internally for us, this is also something that we should be measuring because by being in the ecosystem, we're changing the ecosystem. I think that's a very new kind yeah. of thing. That. Every every year you have so many people at Nalsa, you know, they look forward to, they, they apply to Vithi, they're like, you know, we want to learn from there. And you have several different projects also, right? Competition law and yeah. like several. So it's a great learning experience for us also. So yes, sir, thank you once again. And yeah, it's been great to have this opportunity to interview you. My pleasure, Anurag, and all the best. And I look forward to continuing our conversation in various fora. Yes, sir. Thank you.